Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT show. Uh, as you know, we've been running these shows for uh, a number of years. We're up to well over 160 now. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Uh, again, as we often say, the TNT show and India Live are growing and delivering more exciting shows. You can watch the TNT show, for example, on indialive.net. It's streamed out to YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. Plus, if you want to look at any of the previous 160-odd shows, you can view these on uh, YouTube anytime you like at your leisure. And as I often say, if you're upset by media coverage of political events where journalism is often junked in favour of stenography and or rehashed news releases, if you're looking for an alternative voice, well, you found it. Uh, we like to feel that we're here for you. Uh, you can be here for us, of course, if you can support the crowdfunder. Uh, you know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Uh, today, many people feel that the Labour Party has qualified for the Rowbacker Award. Uh, almost every single policy that they once espoused, they're rowing back from. This seems to include Brexit. And as we'll learn tonight, uh, a very critical area indeed. Well, tonight we'll be talking to another excellent guest. As you know, this is the show for excellent people who come on and talk at length about their areas of expertise. You wouldn't get this, frankly, anywhere else. You know, it just doesn't happen. It's not available. And it's all down to the effectiveness of, of our producer, uh, Kevin, who assiduously seeks out the best people to talk to week after week. And this is absolutely no exception. David Powell, who's joining us tonight, is, it will be talking about free ports and special enterprise zones. Now, you may not know precisely what these are, but we are going to take away all of the misconceptions that may have surrounded these tonight. There will be an opportunity also to put questions, uh, because we're live, you can put questions direct to David. Uh, you'll find the details on the screen. And as you know, TNT stands for the Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license, no problem. Uh, and this is particularly appropriate when we look at the latest BBC uh, Radio Scotland figures, which have fallen off a cliff. Uh, and remember, they are in the recipients of over £300 million uh, pounds per year of licence payers' money, and yet their product is less and less popular every year, whereas this product uh, increases its popularity week upon week. Now, to our guest, David Powell. Thanks for joining us, uh, David. How are you? Yeah, hi, John. I'm good. I'm... I'm um... Uh, live from The Hague with you tonight. Fantastic. Fantastic. How are things in The Hague tonight? Is it blowing a, a storm? Are you experiencing yeah, massive kind of, rainfall? Uh, yeah, it's cold and windy and it's whether you can know how to dress for it, you know? <laughs> That's the key. It's very much like Scotland. Yeah. I think Billy Connolly says there's no such thing as bad weather, it's just inappropriate clothing. So <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's what we'd all like to believe. Now, as I said, thanks for joining us, David. Uh, we'll be talking, as I said in the intro, about free ports and special enterprise zones. Help us through this stuff now. Yeah. What is there? A, is there a difference between free ports and SEZs? And yeah. what are they? And why are they? Okay, so um, what are free ports and SEZs? Um, SEZ stands for Special Economic Zone. You can also say Special Enterprise Zone. Um, I guess the if you think about what a port is, a port with a harbour that deals with freight trans, uh, transshipment, freight comes in to a port area, it's stored, it's processed before it's uh, re-exported. Um, UK free ports, however, are privately owned tax havens, whereas EU ports are publicly owned. So that's, that's, that's really a key difference. So when you see this word free in front of the port, it's a bit like free trade, uh, free markets, uh, free cities, free speech. Yep. It's kind of uh, the opposite of free, actually. It's 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 meant for a certain um, elite, a, more or less a libertarian elite, to um, um, introduce things like corporate governance. Now, a, a special economic zone is a bigger, much bigger version of a free port. Now, if you think about the two Scottish free ports, Cromarty and Inverness, and uh, the Firth of Forth. Um, each of those zones are 45 kilometers in diameter. 
um, you'll see that the size of the port, the actual port in the harbour, is really small compared to that surrounding area. That surrounding area is a special economic zone. So the you know most of the business being set up there will be in an in in that port. But um, what we think, what we see that happens is once the power, the corporate power gets in, they start branching out. They start branching out into the rest of the surrounding um, towns, cities, villages, rural areas. And that's when it starts, especially with deregulated ports after Brexit, it starts getting very bad for local communities. So um, in maybe in a simpler way, we could say a special economic zone is a, uh, a designated region that can house a free port, an airport, a town, entire cities uh, under a privately governed authority. So think of an SEZ, special economic zone, as a room within a room, a state within a state, if we get even smaller, a party within a party. So uh, the UK is now like a kind of a big Russian doll. That is what special economic zones are. It's very appropriate. We call it a Russian doll, actually. So, you know, imagine you, you take that doll's head off inside are all these small states. The point of small states is, is what people like Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak love to talk about. It's about moving away from big government. Um, it's about reducing big government powers and handing them over to small states so companies can effectively manage and govern in those small states. Brexit is the kind of cherry on top for that. So um, this is very interesting, but it's it, it can lead to, say, all kinds of terrible things that we associate with free ports where in countries that are, you know, democracy takes a back seat for economic success. So things like money laundering, private banking, um, arms and weapons trade, human trafficking, stolen art, um, you know, all these kinds of nefarious illicit activities can so actually... Me, sorry to interrupt, David. Let me get this right now. So let's assume that the free port, there's two in Scotland, Cromarty and, and Forth. And let's yeah. assume that the free port uh, in fourth area, which I think most people would 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 would, would understand uh, uh, fully, that forty five kilometer yeah. diameter area that that came up on the screen. Uh, does that mean, for example, that uh, whoever was running that enterprise zone could make up their own laws? Yeah. So they could say, for example, we 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 don't want trade unions. Uh, we don't want uh, uh, health and safety laws. Uh, yeah. We find all of these things hugely restrictive. Yeah. And uh, we uh, and and by the way, we've decided to uh, to involve ourselves in uh, areas which have a big impact on negative impact on uh, human relations generally across the world. The, there would be nothing to. Uh, that would allow the local community. Say, for example, half the citizens of Edinburgh were incensed at these plans. Mm -hmm. Let's assume they were, they were real plans. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, are you saying there's nothing these folks could do about it? No, nothing. That's it. You, you, um, you're effectively allowing corporate governance into that area where they can make their own private laws um, within and beyond the reach of the host country's laws. That's the whole point of exit. That's the whole point of Brexit. You exit the obstacle and remove remove the obstacles of democracy to set up basic yeah a private zone with its own laws. So they've been you know they're a, they base this on um, if you remember the Brexit chant of Singapore on Thames and Hong yeah. Kong. Well, those countries were I mean in in the mid eighteen hundreds they were colonized by by the British and during that time. Um, I think it was in in I, if it either Singapore or Hong Kong, it was eighty two free ports were set up. So they brought their own laws. They kick started the um, the drug trade, you know, just after the two opium wars, and they brought their own courts with them as well. So this was referred to as China's century of humiliation, right? So the economy boomed, um, but all kinds of things like democracy and workers' rights and protections and environmental protection, they were just out the window. So, you know, when, when people like Truss and Sunak talk about admiring the work ethic of, you know, those in Singapore, they're talking about modern day slavery. That's what they admire. Yeah, well, at the same time, I mean, a lot of people uh, in the audience today will have traveled through Changi Airport in S Singapore. 
and they must be saying to themselves, well, my experience of Singapore it wasn't at all like that. Yeah. All, all I could see around about me was growth and yeah. people prospering. And what's wrong with that? Um, it's what's behind the scenes that's wrong. Now, if you start looking into, say, um, uh, specially made buildings like workers' dorms and things like this, they're tiny. They're, they're really badly run. Um, again, you've got people who you won't see as to mostly tourists in Singapore and things like this because they'll be working in those in those areas that are also ring fenced from any kind of public scrutiny. Yeah, right. So it's like the glossy brochure version, but what's behind it is actually um, a total absence of democracy. It's a total absence of being able to vote. You know, things like this. It's it's unbelievable. And that's that's where where Brexit, you know, the uh, where they base their their growth models on. So so let me get this right now. Uh, you're saying there's a big difference between the way free ports operate. Let's stick to free ports for a second. Sure. The way free ports operate in the EU compared to the the way they, they could well work in the UK. Yeah. Um... Let me just... And you reckon that's down to local control or the lack of it? Yeah, I mean, relaxed laws means relaxed enforcement of laws. So, you know, deregulation, which is the number one reason for Brexit, that's, that's, they can't just deregulate the entire country. They eventually will. They will eventually turn it into one big tax haven, but um, they have to start small. So that's where you have competing zones. If you, it, There are, including the free ports, 86 special economic zones being set up. There's 48 in England, 18 special economic zones in Scotland, and eight in Wales. I can also list the um, the um, special economic zones in Scotland. I don't know if that helps people. Yeah, it's fine away. What's yeah. there? Um, so you've got, you've got, obviously, Inverness and Cromarty, Firth, Green. Cromarty, Cromarty. Oh, let me correct you there. It's Cromarty. And the Firth, the Fourth. I'm also saying these things wrong sometimes. No, no, uh, you're wrong. Green, That's okay. Green Freeport, too. So they're not yet operational, by the way. So this is interesting. Um, then we have, okay, this is a bit of a list now. Uh, Creative Clyde, Glasgow is for creative industries. This is all on the government's, the UK government's website. Uh, Prestwick, South Ayrshire for aerospace, West Lothian, Broxburn, food and drink manufacturing, um, West Lothian again with El Eliburn, Livingston, food and drink manufacturing, yeah. Dundee Port, Dundee Claverhouse, Leithport, Edinburgh, uh, Nig Highland, Hatston, Orkney, Scrabster, Highland, Arnish, Arnish. <laughs> Let me get this right. The, 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 this information is drawn from a UK website. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So the UK government is proposing that these be set up. Yeah. Now, a lot of people watching and listening today will assume that that needs the approval of the Scottish government. Is that the case or not? Um, well, it's going through the bidding for all these zones closed in 2021 and 2022. So all the contracts, they've already been made. So this is, you know, if, if you think about, I mean, I've seen re heavily redacted freedom of information letters with the public also demanding to know what the hell is going on. Um, and, you, you, you know, I've seen um, videos of um, uh, redacted documents, you know, just black lines scrolling. It's very easy to get a hold of, but many of those freedom of information uh, requests uh, didn't even come back to people. Okay. So I think one of the main supporters was Kate Forbes in the SNP. Um, yeah, as far as I know, she sent a letter. Uh, there was a letter published where she's fully on board with the UK government and the implementation of free ports and special economic zones. Oh, well, in that case, we'll... we'll, we'll... Uh, well, I will right now. I'll extend an invitation to Kate Forbes to come on the show uh, and tell us whether she agrees with what you just said or not. Uh, but let's let's just examine in more detail what these things are, because yeah. people will be, I suspect, alarmed to learn from you that, uh, that, that there, there could well be established areas in their own country yeah. which will operate free of the laws that bind the rest of the country. Yeah. Uh, now that's, I mean that that 
the reason that people fought against, some people fought against devolution was because that's the very thing they didn't want to see happen. Yeah. Now what we've got is a form of devolution which doesn't require public approval. Mm -hmm. However, it seems to me that the controlling bodies on these entities must have some political representation. Yeah, you would think, right? But um, like I said, we, I mean, I'm working with um, a number of researchers and also um, all across the UK, uh, people like Jim Funnell um, from South Devon and Plymouth um, for that Freeport there. Uh, we've got um, uh, Tartan Tuesday who's one of the main researchers. You can follow her on Twitter. She's just absolutely fantastic at getting, you know, all, all this kind of information out of yeah. all those hidden areas that are just you know everything we research is available in the public domain okay now so let's, 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 my... let's, let's take a look at one of these places in particular let's take a look at fourth yeah who, who are the political representatives you've got a chart somewhere who are yeah. the political representatives from edinburgh falkirk and elsewhere who serve on the on the governing body of the fourth oh, here they are here yeah. So the, the political representative uh, for the City of Edinburgh Council is Cami Day. Yeah. Uh, not Cam Day, Cami Day. Uh, yeah. There's also from Falkirk, there's somebody called Councillor Alan Nimmo. Yeah. And Fife Council is represented by Altony Craig. Craig. Yeah. Uh, apologies, Mr. Craig, if I mispronounced your name. Uh, assuming it's it's a it's a it's a male. Uh, the, the, so the, these three people, uh, as far as I know, uh, are all members of the Labour Party. Yeah, that's true. So there's no representative from other parties on the the the, the board of uh, of, of this. No. Uh, uh, now this strikes me as, as odd. Now th this this board that we're looking at. Uh, yeah. These people are specifically on the board of the fourth yeah. arrangement, yeah. if I can call it that. Yeah. Well, that, that's really quite disturbing. That means that uh, the Labour Party not, is not only fully behind this, yeah. uh, but is actually fully supportive of it. Yeah. <laughs> My word. So that begs an obvious question. It's one that's been raised, David, by uh, people in the audience who are saying that, they're, first of all, they're saying they like what they're hearing, uh, they, they're also saying, uh, what would happen in the event of independence to these entities? Right. That is, yeah, this is where it starts getting very complicated. Um, Scottish independence, there is a problem because something called um, state aid, the UK after Brexit falls under WTO, World Trade Organization rules. And um, that means the UK is defaulted to those rules. It's no longer in the EU, which changes how state aid, which is public money, by the way, in the EU is distributed. So in the EU, it is illegal for governments to give state aid, that is public money, to companies of their choosing because it distorts markets yeah. and creates an unlevel playing field. The member yeah, states yeah. absolutely will not put up with that. Yeah. OK, so um, the, pro the problem is WTO rules are far more flexible and um, it looks very likely that Brexit will um, put effectively sabotage rejoining the EU if the government decides to give state aid under WTO rules to companies of their choosing, a little bit like the PPE crisis. Right, so let me follow this through if I can. In the event that Scotland became independent and wished to rejoin the EU, this would be a severe impediment because the EU would find it impossible to accept Scottish membership. Exactly. If, that, if Scotland at that time contained this sort of state support. Yeah. It's, for it, it, it's, it's just not viable. It, it would, you know, you can also go to the EU Commission's website, which is... Um, I'll just find it uh, on uh, rules of state aid to special economic zones. They have a yeah. whole page there dedicated to that, and they explain exactly what we've just been talking about. Okay. That you cannot have 
you cannot allow markets to self-regulate in these zones. They the, the difference between, first of all, they are ports in um, the EU. They are not free ports. They are ports because they are publicly owned. Free ports yeah. are privately owned. And the same with special economic zones. They have to be um, publicly administered in the EU. You can't have what the EU website that I'm looking at right now says, um, allowing uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand to trust the markets to self-regulate. That is that is just completely disrupting the integrity of the well, members. That, that, that's single essentially the, the, the view that the EU came to, because the other problem I imagine that the EU is selling is it turns out to be a urinating competition, <laughs> yeah. because <laughs> you, you get one lot urinating on the other lot. Yeah. You, know, it, it, you can see what's going to happen here. Yeah. It, it, it would happen on a smaller scale across the UK. Because yeah. every free port would then start to compete with every other free port. Absolutely. And, and the result of that would be a dropping, a, it could be a drastic dropping of standards right across the board. Otherwise, how yeah. can you compete? I mean, you can't yeah. charge your customers more. So, that, that, you know, the, so let me get this right, because Anne Glenn has pointed this out at quarter past eight tonight. She said, look, uh, the EU will not accept our free ports because they're not publicly owned. Yeah. And she's and right in that. No. There is on the on the thirty first of December twenty twenty three, um, Jacob Rees Mogg's R E U L retained E U law bill um, uh, scrapped six hundred E U U K laws um, that affect three main areas. That is employment rights, food safety, and the environmental protection. So overnight. On um, uh, December thirty first, those laws were revoked. They're gone. Mm. So, January the in early January, the UK government produced an REUL retained EU law report. One of the first things it says in that report is um, EU ports are publicly owned and unsuitable for the UK economy. Yeah. Okay. No, let me let me. I, I hesitate to get into the whole political thing here, but. Yeah. There's a fundamental reality, which is that uh, the way the UK is constituted, because uh, it doesn't have a written constitution, of course, mm -hmm. but the way it's constituted in the broadest sense is that no government can bind its successor. So if government A, the current government, has decided this is a good idea, mm -hmm. that is not binding on any successive government. So right. they, they, they can... <laughs> So, so why, why would any commercial entity want to engage in this if they thought it could be abolished yeah. within yeah. three or four years? Yeah. Um, the problem, the other thing that REUL report mentions is that the free ports are future-proofed. So You can't do it. That's, that, 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 that's sophistry. Because in the UK, you cannot make anything future-proof because of the yeah. way the country is constituted. Well, that's what they're saying on the report. No, it's, I mean, it's common sense. It, it, yeah. if, a, if a successor government cannot be bound by its predecessor, you yeah. cannot future-proof anything. Yeah. Whether it be free ports, enterprise zones, not, none of that can be safeguarded. But, yeah, this is where I think, you know, that deregulation starts kicking in because it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect um, sovereignty. It's going to affect... Scottish sovereign sovereignty. It's going to affect. Um, uh, but, but my point, my point though, David, is, is it, it it can't. I mean, the, these these entities are not sovereign states. So if a sovereign state is created round about them, then yeah. that sovereignty will prevail. You you can't future proof. I mean, for example, let's say Scotland became independent tomorrow morning. Yeah. Then all of these enterprises had, should they not fit with that new state's view of what's important, these are all being jeopardy. Mm -hmm. UK law would not apply. Yeah. The, the, any of the safeguards that these organisations thought they had are worthless. Yeah. Yeah. It's so not I, I can imagine if I was running one of these free ports, I'd be spending an enormous amount of effort and energy, if not capital, to make sure that independence never happened. Right. Because yeah, it would no, threaten I, my investment. Yeah. So this is this is really problematic. So the other thing that happens with um, those contracts we talked about that were the bidding for the uh, the zones, um, yeah. The next stage is 
something going on in Honduras now. And you might think, what has that got to do with Scotland? Well, um, a special economic zone, which are also known as private cities, was um, set up on the island of um, Honduras. Now, this is a little story I want to tell you. Um, that was that was um, basically uh, put forward by a guy called Professor Paul Roma, and Professor Paul Roma, he's he's a lecturer at um, U.S. Stanford University. Um, Rishi Sunak's mentor was at, at Stanford was Professor Paul Roma, and he delivered lectures on a return to colonialism, and with by using the framework of the SEZ. Uh, charter city. So Paul Roma went ahead and tried to set one up in um, Honduras and basically the Honduran Supreme Court shut it down because it violated uh, the people's sovereignty and land. Okay, but that the company that tried this that then uh, Paul Roma then quit and then another company came in called Prospera. Prospera now are suing the government under investor state dispute settlement for $11 billion, which is something like two thirds of the GDP of um, Honduras. Okay, because they have they've done something called a 50 year contract, which basically enslaves Honduras, you know, to the ownership of the company. So now it's a big kind of furore around it, of course. Yeah. Um, but the, the Prospera, if you if you go and click on the website of Prospera, um, you've got some key names there um, who are um, they're basically governance consultancies who are building the cities of tomorrow. But what what you know, and they're very proud to tell you that they're they're libertarians and that they believe in you know um, removing the constraints and of. of capital accumulation mm -hmm. and by by privatizing a country yeah so if you think about these sezs all competing with one another if you go right back to the beginning the first thing that will happen is you're going to have job displacement so that's when people from poorer you know or failing uh, regions or communities they will they will basically migrate to the new freeport zone looking for jobs well, the thing that's going to happen there is first they leave behind a community to just fall even further into ruin. and um, But then they enter into something, into a zone where workers' rights, I just told you about the REUL bill, um, they're scrapped. Now, the RNT and the TUC both have issued statements on their websites that they absolutely oppose free ports and special economic zones for, for exactly these reasons. You know, appalling. I, mean, I, I just, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. Let, let's well, let's come back to this a, a little while, if we may. Uh, there is, am I right in thinking there's a free port already up and running in the north of England? Yeah, in Teesside, right? In Teesside. How's that working out? Yeah, that's that's a massive scandal. I mean, I, if you read um, Private Eye, you will see that. Okay, bit of background here. Each free port. So that is uh, 12 free ports in the UK get seed capital, again, public money from the government of 25 million. OK, so times that by 12, that's 300 million. Teesside Freeport has already spent half a billion plus half a billion of taxpayers money on the Freeport. OK, so that's what is that 16, 20 times more than this original sum? And apparently 90% of those profits are going to uh, Mayor Houchin's buddies. Uh, what's his name? Is it Chris Corney and Musgrove? So they set up a thing where the private sector and the public sector, it's completely unbalanced. It's, it, it's weighted heavily in the favor of the private sector. So 90%. And I believe they've made something like £124 million pounds, uh, last year. And apparently, according to Private Eye, none of those profits of the 10% owed to the public sector have materialized. So, you know, that is Sunak's flagship Brexit um, free port. And look, what's, look what it's happening. I, I, on Twitter, I will say, well, rinse and repeat this across, you know, all the other free ports. And not just that that the special economic zones, each special economic zone gets 80 million, 80 million 
um, for, per zone. So times that by 74, it's 5.92 billion, right? Now, I'm also looking at economists and, you know, who are writing about the, these vast sums of money, and they say, well, actually, and people like Professor Alf Baird, it's not enough for long-term sustainability. It is enough for boom and bust to make the profits, you know, and then just move to another zone. Yeah, right? and also the, because the zones, I mean, it, it just seems to be in, intrinsically self-defeating. Yeah. I mean, if you had one zone per state, that yeah. might, might just scrape by. But as soon as you create more than, say, two or three, yeah. all you do is you, you end up, as I said earlier, in this urinating contest. Yeah. It, it, it's bound to work that way. I can't see, you know, I mean, if I'm running a free port and you're running a free port, yeah. The only way I can compete with you, I suspect, is yeah. to drop my standards. Yeah. Thereby lowering my cost base. Yeah. And, and therefore, therefore generating a profit that, that's attractive to people who want to invest in my free port. Right. You then can only reciprocate, I imagine, by doing likewise. Yeah. So eventually we'll have a race to the bottom when yeah. it comes to workers' rights, when it comes to environmental safeguards. And I assume that all of this is entirely possible because of Brexit. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll take you up on that. Um, again, on the government's website, because they've got, you know, a lot of uh, information there about their Freeport levelling up bonanza. Um, the Freeports that Margaret Thatcher set up in the 80s, 90s, um, I think there were 11. Um, the only reason they failed, and it's on the government's website, is because they had to comply with EU regulations. So fast forward to today, Brexit Britain can now turbocharge this kind of deregulation frenzy and the amount of zones. That's why they have so many all over the UK. And the other thing I want people to know about, I wrote an article about um, Mark, the former First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford. Yeah. He signed off. I read the parliamentary transcripts in in Welsh Parliament, and he was. Um, there were questions about, you know, okay, Westminster asking us, asking in inverted commas, to um, set up two free ports in Wales. I think Unismon, Anglesey, and then also uh, Port Talbot. Um, he he did have questions, and questions were put to him, and his answers were, you know, it looked okay. Maybe we shouldn't do this, but in the end, he went off and and signed off two Welsh freeports with Sunak and another central figure who no one seems to know. Well, I know a lot about him, Shankar Singham. Shankar Singham is known. He's a U.S. trade lawyer, and yep. he is known as the brains behind Brexit. So he was effectively a middleman. Shankar Singham is somebody who is, he works for various governance consultancies, and again, private governance consultancies, who are um, providing what he calls the deregulatory framework, so that, you know, companies can, can come in, into the zone, and set up, and not worry about things like, you know, paying taxes, um, think, um, you know, um, uh, um, Supporting and sustaining the local community, workers' rights, all those things, they don't have to, they don't think about this. It's, it's about extracting as many resources and making as much profit you can. And then, yeah, just, just leaving, yeah. go off to your. The funny, the other funny thing though is because um, you normally, you normally hear of things like um, tax havens in the Cayman Islands, right? And Bermuda and, pla you know, places like this. Mm. Well, I think the reverse the re the reverse can happen now. You, you can onshore your wealth within those zones. That's that whole thing about private banking that can take place in, in the Freeport or the SEZ. So did we talk about the fourth ports? Um, isn't it they have six or seven Freeports under their umbrella, which is Tilbury, um, Thames Freeport, uh, Fife, um, I think... Um, yeah, there's a couple of others. It's on the screen somewhere, I think. Maybe. Oh, Kevin can no doubt dig it out. I'll shut up. Well, but, well, you're um, what I was trying to say is um, Otterports Limited is the parent company of Fourthports. Otterports Limited, the managing director of that is Lord Smith of Kelvin in Scotland. 
Yeah. Now, guess where that's registered? It's registered in the Cayman Islands. And Lord Kelvin, sorry, Lord Smith of Kelvin did not declare this in the register of interests. And there is a letter where somebody made a complaint to the government about this and it's been published online. Yeah. So, you know, Kevin, Kevin, can you enlarge the section with the uh, zoom in on the section at the bottom of the page with the with the individuals? Can you do that, Kevin. I'm talking to our producer now, folks. <laughs> I, I, I would just like to take so that people can get a, if we can expand that uh, graphic. If not, don't don't worry. Um, I can try and discern it from here. <laughs> um, yeah, we it, it's it's just it's just not possible to read it. Uh, but anyway, it it, it looks like uh, the Scottish government has agreed to uh, yeah. significant labour representation on the Freeport arrangements in in Scotland. Yeah. yeah, I got that. That's from yeah, that's from uh, Wikipedia. Yeah, I've seen that. I was hoping we we, we could look at more closely at all the. The, the various actors here are on the other page. Yeah. Let's not go down the Wikipedia way. It's, it's, it's just frankly tedious. But, uh, but if, if it were possible to take a look, a closer look at the, uh, the individuals who, who, were, uh, who were highlighted there. Yes, this, this graph here. Um, yeah. So for the benefit of, <laughs> we can't read the small, oh my, we're all over the place here. Uh, I'm not sure this is working out as well as we'd hoped, uh, but essentially there's a lot of nice folks there uh, who uh, who will be, uh, as I gather it, running these. Uh, I can these read things. it out. Okay. Well, you... it, 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 it doesn't have the same impact, but, but I, I suffice to say that uh, there are very few uh, political uh, political. Uh, they're all, perhaps they're all political appointees, but members of political parties there. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of these folks I gather are uh, business people. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that, 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 that's that. I, I think uh, the reality is that uh, the, the Scottish government uh, has signed up for these. And that's why I think it would be terribly important for, uh, for Kate Forbes uh, perhaps to come on the show and explain the logic behind this, because on the face of it, based upon what David has been telling us, uh, there, there might not be a universal welcome uh, for these. And if there's also if there's a dearth of information, uh, then it's unlikely that there'll be any enthusiasm at all if people don't know what the heck they're paying for. Uh, that's never a good look, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, those those free ports, they, they, they will be maintained at great public cost. And within that, you're going to have, um, I mean, I think we're all aware that there are many councils now um, facing bankruptcy all over the UK. I wonder about the councils in Scotland, actually. Not so much because the Scottish they, government supports the councils. Yeah. yeah, but are there any trouble with the councils there in, in Scotland? Well, there, there, there's always a debate between uh, local uh, government and central government. In this case, I'm talking about Edinburgh mm -hmm. and the amount of funding. Uh, so if, if, if the Treasury reduces the funding uh, for the Scottish government, obviously, in every sense, the Scottish government has to reduce its funding yeah. uh, for the entities that it, it funds. It's just a straightforward yeah. uh, piece of arithmetic. Uh, and there, there's always a debate about what, what's not being cut and what is being cut. But my understanding is that the Scottish government, I mean, for example, has maintained its support against the uh, people affected by the bedroom tax, and that continues. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's because it made decisions that, that don't align with the priorities and values of, of Westminster. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think my sense of it is that there's a lot of people at Westminster who find that shocking. And yeah. unacceptable, and we'd rather it stopped. Uh, and it looks to me as if the Labour Party is not going to address any of these things, no. because it seems to have developed a policy stream that that chimes very closely with that which we presently experience with the Conservatives. So we have to wait and see what's going to happen there. I, suppose, I imagine, but based on, I mean, 
if you were to people in the audience tonight might, might be thinking, oh, this really upsets me. Having listened to what David has to say, what can they do about it, David? Yeah, the only thing we, I mean, I've been the last year speaking at public meetings in um, South Devon and Plymouth. That was hosted by George Monbiot from The Guardian. I did a talk with a really great um, anti freeports SEZ group in Liverpool, Radical Pensioners Group, and they were absolutely livid that Labour, Steve Rotherham, the mayor there, um, you know, had signed off on these free ports. They were just crazy. It was really incredible. They were absolutely shocked and outraged at, you know, their rights being taken away about Liverpool. I mean, Liverpool's really traditionally hardcore left, you know, but yeah. this is an absolute betrayal. So they're, they're going nuts. Um, I did also a talk with a church group in London. Um, so all kinds of different, you know, facets of, of of communities all over the UK. I've done the most talks I've done actually are in Scotland. So uh, this weekend I was I was um, I was talking speaking at Inverness uh, Anti Free Ports Campaign Group. Um, I really that was sad because I I, I had my my flight was cancelled the day before. And um, I really wanted to see Inverness, so I'm hoping um, they'll want me back. Um, but again, the talk, exactly the kind of things we are talking about, people in the audience completely unaware um, that basically, you know, their sovereignty is being commodified, their councils are being bankrupted. Who is going to run these councils? Who is going to provide the public services? Well, it's going to be the corporation. Now, you know... I get a lot of flack for suggesting anything remotely to do with what we call charter cities and private cities, but I don't see, I, I just work with the kind of parallels I make, which are from, you know, these zones where democracy is just shoved aside for, for corporations to set in, um, step in and make their own profits, or, you know, again, this kind of return to colonialism. And I sure. think after China, the British now are, are turning this back onto their own citizens. It's no coincidence that protest is being slammed, right? You can't hold up a blank piece of paper anymore without getting arrested. Yeah. So so you reckon what people should do is write to their MPs or MSPs and say, look, uh, we, we just don't like the sound of this. Now we know a bit more about it. We'd like you to tell us and reassure us uh, that what we've heard uh, might not come to pass. I mean, people are entitled to these reassurances, it seems to me. Uh, I mean, if we're talking about, particularly if we're talking about spending public money. Yeah. By all means, write to your MPs and councillors, but every single meeting I've attended, the most, the only councillors who turned up were the Green Party. Yeah. Um, the the Labour councillors, the Tories, they didn't even bother turning up. Okay. Yeah. So how does that look to the locals? They're supposed to represent us. Yeah. And there was, I mean, I told you, we have, we've got some incredible big, Big accounts uh, following us now on Twitter. People, uh, I did an interview with Carol Vorderman uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, was this on LBC? Furious. Was this on LBC or was it? Yeah, it was on LBC. Yeah. Um, it was a very brief intro, but you know the feeling, the absolute anger, outrage, it's all there, and it's great to be on this show and actually dig in a bit more, a lot more into what is going on. So I want to thank you again for that. Um, oh, I, I wonder if there are any questions out there, actually. We, we've had loads and loads of questions. Uh, you've addressed some of them. Uh, obviously, people are concerned about private contractors servicing free ports like managing agents uh, yeah. who might ring fence, ring fence contracts and maintenance and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, you know, and, and people are worried about, you know, what might happen here. Um, but th th there's also a strong sense that people feel that, well, you know, th this this is part of the British state and its decline. Uh, yeah. After independence, there'll be a clean slate and, and all of these things will be wiped out. Uh, I, I heard your, your comparison with Honduras. Uh, yeah. And I know that it is possible to go to international courts and, and seek uh, some sort of settlement there. Uh, I'm not sure that would apply when there's a change of state because then the new state could say, well, that went before. I mean, we're not bound in any way, shape or form to an undemocratic entity that pre-existed us. Yeah. And we, 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 like all sovereign states, uh, assume the right to 
to either agree or disagree with what went before. Otherwise, there'd be no point in changing the state. Did you also know, there's another thing we didn't mention yet, compulsory purchase orders. Did, we didn't talk about that, right? So last no. year, uh, on Go Michael Gove's levelling up um, section on the UK government website, he added um, another section on compulsory purchase orders. And this is horrific. So compulsory purchase orders apply to business, agriculture, and residential properties. And they even say on the website, I'm going to paraphrase, we, we understand that it's upsetting and worrying for you to lose your, your business, uh, your, your property, residential or otherwise, but this is in the, in the pursuit of levelling up. So this is what I think is happening, why I call it, yeah, engineered insolvency of the councils. Gove is also selling off all those public assets. Um, he's also invited a team of what he calls emergency managers to step in, in places like Birmingham, um, to start, you know, well, I think, yeah, installing corporate corporations to take over. They're going to, they will say they are rescuing um, uh, democracy from its failures. Yeah. So the only way to go is via the private sector. That's very, very worrying. Yeah. Compulsory purchase orders. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it all sounds like uh, increased centralization. Yeah. At a time when people are crying out for decentralization. Yeah. I mean, more and more people seem to accept the view they prefer decisions, local decisions taken locally. But this I mean, is what whenever you go and ask people. Yeah. You have to be very careful because this is also the kind of ammunition for this whole small state coming up it's it's like a kind of smoke and mirrors subterfuge to say well yeah we 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 hear the locals and this is what happened in honduras but there was local outrage and it took the supreme court to undo this but like i said they are now being sued for 11 billion dollars right so this is where it, this is the whole thing of libertarianism Lib libertarianism meaning freedom freedom of the individual freedom to liberty freedom yeah. from taxes and things like this um this is this is the kind of um, yeah it's 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 very very dangerous. So well you know this freedom thing it applies to a certain amount of people and that's basically the one percent. But that doesn't apply in the EU and the reason it doesn't apply in the EU as I understand it is because the one percent are not in charge of these free ports. Yeah. These totally. ports yeah. they're publicly owned. Yeah. Right. So. If there is a solution to this, then the solution is that if it has to happen in Scotland, for whatever reason uh, that's opaque right now, uh, the way to obviate the problems that we've been discussing is for those entities to be publicly controlled. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That you're, you're basically mirroring the whole point of Brexit is to get rid of all of that yeah. and to introduce corporate governance and corporate powers in small states. That's the way you break it down into little pieces. You turn the UK into a Russian doll. So, so if you had a, a magic wand, what would you like to, uh, if you could wave it tomorrow morning and, and, and create something that you would much prefer to see what would you like to create? Um, I would like to see happen? back in the EU again. Uh, I would like for, for, for all kinds of reasons, also about Ukraine, also about um, protecting people from the, the kind of predatory capitalists out there who are trying to take everything from the public sector, who are demonizing people for whatever race or whatever, you know, identity they are whatever their um, jobs are, you know, this, this kind of hunting people down and punishing them, um, when basically the, the opposite of that is, is, is corporate welfare that using public money to actually crush the public sector. Yeah. That is, you know, libertarians, they talk about um, the public services at the end of the day are just small potatoes to them. Their goal is something called, they refer to as countrypreneurship, where you basically you've got a nation as your your target for your libertarian dream. So I want that to be swept away. I want all the think tanks to be swept away. You know the IEA, the ERG, 
um, policy exchange. I mean, many of those think tanks are charities. They are funded by the taxpayer, you see? So I want all that gone. I want Labour. If Labour are going to go back to the left, please do. They're not doing that. After Blair, they just, you know, Thatcher said Tony Blair was her, is her greatest achievement in life. So someone like Starmer now, he's just carrying the baton on with, with the SEZs and the uh, the Freeports. It's none of it is good. I say Scottish independence, Welsh independence, um, join the EU. Well, but, but you, are, uh, you also said it would be very difficult. It would be possible for that to happen. That is my magic wand. wand. Yeah, of course. So the magic wand would, the, the preceding step in your sweep of the magic wand would be the abolition of all the Freeports. Yeah. And, and that would enable the EU to look upon any uh, yeah. prospective re-entry uh, more. I mean, just regulate them. That's all they have. To, they just have to regulate them in line with the EU's ports. Yeah, but we're not seeing any any good faith from either of our all of our rep, so-called representative parties. And you don't, you don't. But two quick things I like to raise with you: uh, uh, the uh, Craiger is asking about your homepage. He said it's mainly artwork. Uh, related to free ports, but I guess you would prefer to direct people to your Twitter account rather than... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm an artist. I lecture in contemporary art. That is also, I mean, you cannot be an artist today without being political. You know, yeah. all art is political. Um, I, it was the reason I started diving into this was because I was denied a vote on Brexit. Um, you know, I'm living in The Hague in, uh, in, in Holland. And um, uh, a couple of my friends were also denied a vote on Brexit. So it just, just made me really angry. I can't actually sell my work into the UK anymore because um, I would need a second accountant, which is just prohibitively expensive. So, you know, I just began peeling back the wall, peeling back the layers and looking into what it was. And it's just horrific. Now, are you, are you perhaps, this is an incidental question, but in light of our... A uh, very, very em emotional uh, show last week, and which featured people from uh, re reunite families UK, people whose families had been uh, uh, effectively become estranged because of Brexit legislation, and the fact that it's well now impossible to get a visa uh, yeah. for people who, who don't hold a British passport. Have you been affected by that? Um, I still have a European passport. Um, you oh, you, oh, why is that? It'll expire this year, so I have to get one of these horrible black, blue, black British passports. Oh, I things. see, I see. I, will, you know, I don't have to queue up at the moment when I'm going in and out of the UK and the EU. So, But come November, yeah, I'll have a new passport when I have to. My girlfriend will be in the easy queue and I'll be in the long queue. But, yeah, I think it's absolutely dreadful that um, also putting up this, um, what is it, if you want to bring a partner over to the That's UK. It. That's 38 it. grand or something. I think the 38 grand is you have to earn, you, the pair of a couple can earn this together. So I've just heard of someone who's moved to Dundee from The Hague, a Scottish girl, brought her Dutch partner over to the UK. But it's still a lot of money, you know. Well, And also it's, it's changeable. And yeah, the fact exactly. that you pay it this year doesn't mean it's the same amount next year. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. there's no consultation. I mean, and, and one of our guests said that this is really quite chilling. She said, "You know, what? Why are you targeting us? Yeah, what have we done?" And they said, "Well, we're not targeting you. We're targeting. This is what they said to her: We are targeting the others. You are just collateral damage." Oh my God, that's horrible! Isn't that shocking? Yeah, it's horrible. I mean, this is this is these are MPs talking. Yeah, yeah. And, and don't forget those those a lot of there was this EU exodus of workers right from after Brexit they they were like well well we're not putting up with this the ones who could leave and who could go back to Europe but you know splitting up families dividing you know no freedom of movement all this kind of it's it's all it's horrible absolutely horrible and, and, it, and it, it's it's also terribly self defeating I mean yeah. you know the reality is that if, if this continues for very much longer. There'll be an exodus of people, obviously not necessarily to EU countries, but to elsewhere. Yeah. Where conditions are, are better, perhaps. And also, there, there will be a, a, a much reduced influx yeah. of necessary people. Yeah. I mean, the calculation is that without immigration, the UK is going to be in a parlous condition 
yeah. very soon. So it's like cutting, cutting off your nose to spite your face. Yeah. It, 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 there's no way this makes any sense. I mean, the, that, darker, the darker picture as well is that those companies that set up in those zones, they can just pay people a pittance, you know, and make the profits, pay no taxes, and they're tax exempt for 10 years, these zones. I mean, how on earth does that give anything back to local infrastructure and communities? And, you know, it's it's... You're gonna you're gonna be seeing extreme contrast of poverty and um, um, affluence and you know riches and things. Like it. It's it's the contrast will get even more stark. So, since we since we agree, David, that that Brexit probably caused this uh, yeah. horrendous uh, aggravation of of, of the situation. Uh, let me ask you the question that we've asked other guests: Why do you think Brexit happened? What motivated people, uh, and we, Danny Darling was on our show, and you pointed out that Brexit happened mainly because of uh, middle class people in the southeast. <laughs> it's, it's, that was his analysis based on the numbers, as opposed yeah. to the emotional responses about, oh, it's all these folks in the north of England. He said it's categorically not true. Yeah, uh, um, I I believe it's it's tied up with um, what we, well, what I've been researching are exit strategies from the 1960s that were birthed, you know, in the wake and in, in hostile response to um, Roosevelt's New Deal in 1932, which lasted for 30, 40 years, egalitarian governance, you know, prosperous uh, healthcare, all that kind of stuff, sharing the wealth, managed capitalism. Um, I think uh, yeah, it's it's very true that all the think tanks they hated this. They hated the idea of what they call um, the theft of their property. So they started to develop these exit strategies. So um, Brexit is a kind of uh, um, yeah, some a kind of ideology made flesh. And here we are. I mean, the IEA is it seventy years has been running the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, set up by a battery chicken farmer, you know, Anthony Fisher. And he was advised by Hayek to never disclose the partisan agenda to the public because they would be outraged and then they would lose their charity status. But that's, in a way, for me, that all links up to this Russian doll thing, you know, the, the state within a state, the room within a room, the party within a party. We all know those think tanks are pushing for libertarian exit. That's what Brexit is. That's where it, that's where it comes from. Further back, it goes back to colonialism, East India yeah. Company in 1600 and Singapore, eight, mid 1800s, and they're just, well, they're just reincarnating it for today. It, it's crazy. Uh, you talked about the, the IEA. I think you said has charitable status. Yeah. And somebody questioned that recently, and the Charities Commission came back and said, "No, your grounds for challenging it, uh, IEA status, are political, and we don't deal in political things." Uh, our experience. I set up uh, an entity called the Constitutional Commission. Yeah. And one complaint during the 2014 referendum from the Conservative Party that this was political uh, resulted in the Charities Commission writing to me saying, uh, is this true? And I thought, well, hold on a second. You know, what, what is this all about? You know, I mean, I, I, <laughs> you know, it, it, we, we, we explained when we applied for uh, charitable status that it was non-political. It was about constitutions, mm -hmm. which is about state building. It's not about political party building. But one complaint was sufficient to uh, have them clutching their perils. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yet here we have a situation where the IEA uh, is uh, unaffected. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a strange old thing. Look, uh, we've exhausted our one hour. I, I, I'm, I'm deeply grateful to you, David, for giving up your time. Uh, I appreciate it a lot. As I said, we plan to be educational and informative and and at the same time be entertaining. And I think you've done all of that for us tonight. And I greatly appreciate it. If you can hang on for a couple of seconds once we close off, I'd appreciate that. Let Thanks. me just say a few concluding remarks in addition to a big thank you to David. Uh, uh, we, we've got, uh, as we always do, a list of exciting guests lined up for you in the future. Uh, you know, if you want to uh, hear from the big hitters and see uh, what they have done and what they're doing, and, and also that a lot of the material you don't get elsewhere. You, you, nobody ever is going to provide a, an hour for us to talk about what David's been talking about so eloquently. So 
A look out for next week's guest. We'll be talking to Cameron Greer uh, from Young Scots for Independence, and we'll be talking about uh, what he's doing and what he thinks the prospects are. I mean, bearing in mind the backcloth to that is, of course, there is enormous support for independence amongst people uh, aged between 18 and, and 25. Uh, it's almost matched by the lack of enthusiasm of those 65 and plus. Um, so there we go. Uh, and maybe you can explain to us why that might be the case. A big thank you again to David and thank you to all of you for watching and listening tonight. Look forward to seeing you all next week. In the meantime, stay safe and take care. Good night all. Well, thank you again, David.